Super Signs allowed me to really start that process of working with plasma. It gave me the, the sense that this was definitely a possibility that I could work with. Even though I was basically fresh in the sea of the potential for plasma with very little working knowledge. As mentioned, it's very important that I had a sense of how the process worked, the tools and the equipment that I had, and then the batching or multiple works because I was going to have failures as a newbie, like a really fresh newbie. That stage in which I worked with Super Science led me into the second part of that collaboration. Um, so I reached out to someone I remember that took the class, and that was Ash Williamson. So I went over to his place, stayed the night, we pumped neon plasma all night, and Ash Williamson helped me collaborate to finish the process of having pieces pumped and filled, which is really awesome. So connecting with people, your contemporaries, and knowing those connections is important here, and having those relationships are very important. Hello. Disclaimer here, there's something I have to tell you before we can begin. The information provided by Tammy Lightning is designed to provide helpful information and to educate on the subjects discussed. That being said, the information provided is true and complete to the best of our knowledge, and is not intended to be used without professional guidance or supervision. All recommendations are made in good faith by both Tammy Lightning and affiliates, to which we disclaim any liability in connection with the use of the information we provide. Thus, we ask that you be safe, be informed, and ask questions. Let's get right to it. Geeks and Taming Lightning are making a four-part episode series that's functionally a survey or lecture in podcast format. Percy has produced Taming Lightning for three years with 30 episodes released. Percy has a full-time job in the hotel industry and uses his spare time to generate this content. In a few episodes, he literally goes the extra mile and travels to provide a personal touch to the conversation. Geeks believes the Glass community is incredibly lucky to have this resource, and it's our goal to replace that luck with financial support. We have an initial goal of raising $2,800 to support this four-episode series. That translates down to 100 listeners chipping in $7 each per episode. We hope that you'll support Percy's expertise and help us establish precedent by compensating valued voices in the field. Every donation really counts. We have a link in the show notes to get started. If you're on a computer, click the donation button on our Taming Lightning page. If you're listening on the go, send a Venmo donation to at geeksglass with the word plasma. That's P-L-A-S-M-A. Thanks in advance for your support. Welcome back or welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II. I'm the creator and host of Taming Lightning, as well as the Emerging Plasma Tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center. Taming Lightning Podcast features a series of conversations to help expand our understanding of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential for noble gases as an artistic medium. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 36. And in today's podcast, I'll be joined by Ben Orozco for the chapter three of Intro to Plasma series in collaboration with Geeks, the Glass Education Exchange. This series is an introduction for glass educators and makers who are new to the process of plasma, as well as an introduction to Percy and his thoughts and experiences on learning about plasma. So in chapter three, it's lit chemistry of collaboration. We'll be talking about the alchemy that takes place when we bring plasma units under a vacuum, the considerations when mixing gases for various effects, working with collaborators to fill vessels, as well as utilizing technology to illuminate and energize our vessels. And we'll focus on general concepts, terms, and approaches while acknowledging different circumstances and variations in the process. Take note that we'll be going through a lot of content today. 
If you're watching the podcast on the Geeks YouTube page, we'll have some helpful timestamps covering each of the topics we'll be discussing today. And listen through this episode, in chapter one and two, to get a better understanding of the process, even if you don't have everything you need at the moment. So grab a snack, a drink, and get comfortable with your notebook. Let's begin the episode by revisiting Percy's Elements of Plasma Diagram, which we discussed in Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Looking at the visual diagram, you'll notice that there's a lot of overlap, and that's partly why it's difficult to neatly separate elements going into the plasma lamp production, especially between alchemy and technology, which we'll be discussing today. In the alchemy process, we'll cover noble gases, fill pressures, and filling technique. And then the technology process will cover things like power supplies, leak detection, using vacuum manifold, and using a gas transfer system. Now, as I mentioned, there is some overlap, especially between other sections, such as alchemy and vessel crafting. And this would include fill pressure, gas recipe, use of phosphors, and glass color. Between alchemy and technology, there is filling technique and the bake-out process, in which we'll discuss cleanliness. In Chapter 2, Taking Shape, we talked about how we can use plasma in our glass vessels. But what is plasma and how do we define it on a scientific level? I think the first thing we'll have to do is define plasma as a state of matter. So plasma, also described as ionized gas, is one of the four fundamental states of matter. The other three being solids, liquids, and gases. I personally like science and chemistry. That and math were one of my strongest subjects in school, but I've taught and assisted in a few plasma classes and acknowledge that not everyone has been inspired or interested in science and chemistry. So I think it would be fair to briefly talk about each state and their transitions. And if you're watching on YouTube, we have a graphic from sciencenotes.org as a visual. So, let's define matter. Matter refers to everything in the universe that has mass and takes up space. All matter is made of atoms of elements. When we're talking about the states of matter, they are generally described and based on qualities that can be seen or felt. So starting out with solids, they have a definite shape and definite volume. And this is because the molecules that make up the solid are packed closely together and move slowly. So one example could be rocks or ice. So adding heat or energy to a solid melts and then becomes a liquid. Now a liquid is defined, it has a definite volume, but takes up the shape of its container. So ice turns to water or molten lava from solid rock as a result of intense heat. Now liquid through evaporation then becomes a gas. Now gas has an indefinite volume and an indefinite shape. And because of this, it fills the entirety of its container now, there is a great deal of space between those molecules, in which they have a lot of kinetic energy. That's what allows them to fill that container and take any shape. That would be if boiled water becomes steam, and gas through ionization becomes a plasma if you add more heat or electromagnetic energy. Now, plasma is a little bit different, right? It's very similar to gas in that it has an indefinite volume and indefinite shape. It's only really defined by the vessel that it's contained in, right? Mm -hmm. What makes it different from gas is that it also creates a sea of charged particles, allows it to conduct electricity. So this is formed by heating or by electromagnetic fields to ionize the gas. An example would include stars, lightning, fluorescent lights, neon signs, and gas discharge tubes. This is a lot of stuff, right? But there's a little bit more to go into here to really understand a little bit about plasma. So. Here's somewhat of a simplified description of the gas transitioning in the plasma. So in accordance to what we're doing with plasma lamps here, we have a transformer that produces a high voltage and high radio frequency electromagnetic waves. The radio waves is then being transmitted by high voltage wire and emanating from the electrode. Now these radio waves cause electrons to move, similar to, similar to radio antennas, where they also are picked up and received. But here they are at a higher frequency, which means more energy, and this results in gases being ionized. Now ionization is when the electrons absorb the energy from the radio wave, 
creating a high energy state that is ripping the electrons off the atoms of the gases and separating them into positive nuclei and negative charges. So, plasma is a gas that has received so much energy that a fair amount of atoms lose their electrons, and those free electrons become a sea of charged particles, creating conditions for it to conduct electricity. Now, when those free electrons jump back in, it results in a lower energy level state, and that loss of energy results in a photon of light. Now, there's a lot of things that we're still talking about here. There's still a lot more to go in, but I'll keep going here for you guys. There are some forms of plasma we can think about. Now, these forms are such as the partially ionized plasma, aka cold plasma. The plasma described as an ionization of less than 100%, and I could be wrong, but this could be described as a disruption of those electrons. Think of fire, lightning, fluorescent tubes, and neon, the things that we're doing here with us. But there's another type of plasma. It is a fully ionized plasma, also known as hot plasma. So hot that the energy of the matter is ripping apart the atoms and leaving an entire collection of charged particles. Think of our sun, stars, or nuclear fusion. Again, this is a lot of high-level stuff, but the important thing is to have the correct labels when we want to go deeper into plasma. Then there's the plasma discharge. What we are making are essentially gas discharge tubes, and we are calling them plasma lamps or plasma sculptures to simplify and acknowledge the variable forms, vessels, or envelopes that can be produced beyond the tube. There are three discharge or modes describing the range of various effects. Because they are used interchangeably, I will call them discharge modes. The first mode is the dark discharge mode. The particles are ionized, but there isn't enough particles of energy to produce light. The next is the glow discharge mode. Low pressure range where, there, where, as it describes, it produces a glow. Think neon tubing and some of the examples shown in Chapter 2, such as the geometric form with Charvin and works by Fumi Amino. And then we have the arc discharge mode. This is where there's a path of least resistance for the energy to travel. A lot of energy going out that is becoming these filaments or strings of light that we've seen in various examples in Chapter 2, such as the plasma move trophy with Chris Ahalt and Ed Kirshner's Chalice. And this is a good moment to articulate the difference between neon, like neon signage, and plasma. Yeah, the effects of plasma lamps are created by both high voltage and high radio frequency waves in a higher pressure volume. You know, this energy comes from a special form of plasma driver or transformer, which we'll be discussing in the second half of this chapter. And that neon illumination comes from the arc created in a lower pressure and smaller volume of gas tubing with a high voltage power that creates a pathway or circuit in the gas through two electrodes. Now that we've had a moment to define plasma, let's talk about the gases that we use for plasma and what qualities they might have. First, uh, I'll list the noble gases and their baseline colors in low pressure discharge tube. So we have helium, which has a peach or kind of pinkish color to it. Um, then you have neon, which is orange-red. Argon, which is kind of a lavender or purple. Um, it becomes like a, like a light blue if used with uh, mercury and such as a neon. Then you have krypton, which is white. And then xenon, with the, which is white with a tinge of blue. There's radon and organesion but uh, we don't use those gases. Radon, especially because it is highly radioactive, and organesion is a synthetic noble gas that can only last for microseconds, so don't even look at those. And why are we using noble gases and not other gases in the peri periodic table? So noble gases have a closed valence outer shell of electrons and lend themselves to being non-reactive or stable. Now, they are easier to ionize in their natural state going from a gas to plasma, and also naturally exist in a gas state at room temperature. And there are some other gases or vapors that can be used in plasma fills, right, Percy? Yeah, uh, these would include nitrogen, which is an inert in the vessel and tends to make the color that is like light blue or actually like a lavender or pinkish sort, um, and oxygen, which is reactive but uh, has been used and tends to give uh, some mixtures sort of a golden color to it because it does have a bit of a yellow glow to it. 
Um, and then there are halogens, and they are highly reactive. You know, iodine um, as a color agent changes the color to a deep blue, but it adds some sort of uh, movement and effects that you may have seen in some of the vessels that um, we'll be showing pretty soon here. So um, mm -hmm. you have to be careful with these, these as it is a reactive material and it can react to metals. And then mercury as used in neon and fluorescent lighting to generate brilliant light blue, but in plasma doesn't really ionize completely, so it's not as useful. Now, I mentioned these halogens and I mentioned these other gases uh, that we can use. There are some risks and rewards when working with these extra gases, right? So the rewards is you get something that's uniquely aesthetically um, that some plasma plasma workers uh, may have used and others have not. Um, but there are some risks, and I'm going to list them from least to most dangerous. So the least, uh, the lowest risk uh, is that you have a failed lamp. You know, it browns out or light slowly fades or it doesn't light up at all. Uh, and then the next up is contamination or damage to your manifold components. Remember, these halogens are highly reactive. They can contaminate, corrode, and destroy things like your gauges, your valves, your vacuum pump, and some of your more expensive components, anything that's metal, right? That's why we're using glass for the most part in our manifolds when we're doing these things. And then the greatest risk is the potential for medical risk for yourself and others. Working with these materials require you to have dedicated skills and practices to handle them. And if you don't, they can react adversely to organic material, and that includes your skin. So what we advise in the pursuit of using some of these halogens or vapors uh, or other gases is to make sure you're working with someone who has experience in the process uh, that you're interested in and using them and learn about the process and depth before trying it out. Definitely. Now that we have a general sense of the gases used in plasma and their effects, let's talk about the possibilities in gas fills and aesthetic considerations for color to follow up from chapter two, taking shape. A lot of what happens in this process is alchemy, which is a lot of trial and error. You can gain knowledge just by doing the, the process, but what you must also have in mind is to act with proper documentation of results and the steps you took to get there. And you need to make sure that because you documented those things, that you can repeat those procedures and have measurable steps. You know, you have to be the scientist at noting and handling unknown variables. So let's start with fill pressure of gas and the light qualities that creates. Fill pressure of our gases will affect the way gases behave in our vessel. And we'll be talking about our fill pressure in measurements of TOR. Uh, TOR is a common unit for reading pressure gauges, 1 to 760 TOR, or 1 to atmosphere. Um, there is also BAR and PASCAL, which are, uh, they are measurements that are more standardized units of measuring pressure. Mm -hmm. So starting uh, with low pressure, this is things that are less than 50 TOR, roughly. You know, remember, these, these pressures are just general ranges here. And this is where you have your soft glow discharge, or as we mentioned earlier, the glow discharge mode. And then also within that, neon is somewhere between 6 and 18 tor, so it's a bit lower, but we're also working with smaller diameters. I have a visual up from EGL, which is a neon company, and there's a pretty standardized list of tor amounts for filling for different um, gas types and tube types. And in our medium pressure range, this will be between 50 to 125 tor. Um, you have short formations of arcs or filaments that are dancing about, which means you kind of have a mix between the glow and filament or arc discharge. Uh, as we described in the range before, we went from dark to glow to arc. Well, there's a lot of things that happen in between that spectrum uh, listing on those three points, and this is kind of one of those midpoints between your glow and your arc. So if you're thinking about that, you have a high pressure, which is things that are a bit greater than 125. In some of my smaller experiments, I found that that's kind of like the tipping point before you get to a high filamentary effect, and this is like a very expressive arc or behavior. So more arc than glow, think of possibly the lightning effect, 
or if it's just unique behaviors. And we have artists that are using their fills up to as high as 500 to 600 torr, so they're being pretty close to atmospheric pressure. So quickly note that the more pressure you have, the more power you'll need. And we'll cover that in a little bit more detail when we start covering technology later in this episode. And where can we start with mixing various gases for various effects? Is there anything that we should be keeping in mind? Sure. Uh, with gas mixtures and recipes experiment, it can be hard to quantify and provide clear guidance, but in general, the process is adding and observing with little amounts and different mixtures. It's kind of like mixing paints. For example, when you're trying to make purple, it isn't just simply add red and blue. The reds and blues matter, and what colors you use to make your light or darker, um, that can either make it bright or dull. So think about it like this. Your purple isn't just, oh, I'm making just a purple. There are various purples that transition between those two colors, more red or more blue, mm -hmm. and lighter or darker, and vibrant or duller. And that's kind of what you're working with here. It doesn't work exactly like how paints are, but the analogy here will help you get a sense of how to approach your mixes. And then uh, also environmentally, this process of filling and wasting noble gases has no ill effects, as the gases themselves can be distilled from the air we breathe. But you'll need to be careful with these other gases and vapors, like halogens. Uh, you don't want those sucking back through your system where it can end up attacking your gauges, your valves, your metal components in your system. It's best to, like, once it goes and it doesn't seem like it's going to work out, that you just seal it up and put it away because uh, you don't want that coming back mm -hmm. into your system. And also remember that other variables like geometry, surface, and electrode placement are going to affect the way your plasma behaves and the color of those gases inside. You know, size, volume, shape, all that affects the gas mixture. So listen to the second half of chapter two for an overview of aesthetic considerations to keep in mind. And this is a good spot to bring up glass color since we introduced it in chapter two but we didn't really get into working with the gases to create the light effects. Sure. So one of the things that you could end up using and to start out with, we'll, we can talk about phosphors. You know, many colors you see in neon and some in plasma come from phosphors that react with the UV emitted by the plasma lamps or the neon lamps, right? So that gives you a little more options outside the spectrum of noble, noble gases. And then working with these powders allows you to coat the interior walls of clear glass and sometimes if you want to expand even more, with your colored glass vessels. Now, when we're talking about glass color, this is what you're building into your vessel, right? So this is where something like color theory comes into play, which in visual arts would help you provide guidance and color mixing and visual effects. And the use of color in your glass vessel will provide you with uh, the color of your vessel and a aesthetic and philosophical attribute, right? So but also it acts as a filter for the light produced by the plasma. Uh, while the aesthetic and philosophical uses, which is the how it looks and how it, the meaning is contrived to your color, uh, are up to you, the effectiveness, effectiveness of your color choices will be dependent on understanding the subtractive color mixing, which can be defined as absorbing or subtracting every color except the color of the glass. An example will be having a red tint glass, which will absorb all the color of light except for the red light, only letting red light through. This is much like sunglasses, protective glasses worn when using torches or welding, windows or decorative lamps, where you are, where the varying shades that limit the transmission of light. And that effectiveness of the filter, its transmissivity, can influence the lighting choices. Whether that transmissivity was designed or inherent to the process and techniques you use when making and practicing. So think about the surface qualities you'd like to have going back to chapter two. Translucency versus, versus opacity, clarity and distortion. Do you want the viewer to look through the vessel into the light or focus more on the surface details? And we have a great article in the show notes about color mixing with glass. Now that we've discussed plasma as a state of matter, 
gas types, pressures, and mixes, and aesthetic considerations for those. We'll delve into pre-filling requirements after a short word from our sponsor. Today's podcast is sponsored by Global Rare Gases by Jim Avolt, who trades in crude and purified rare gases and as a small company is agile and tending to the needs of their customers, including small business and personal consumers of rare gases. Now, Global Rare Gases has been a favorite supplier for Taming Lightning and the Pittsburgh Glass Center. They provide honest and informed purchasing, speedy, efficient, and reliable delivery. I've personally recommended Global Rare Gases to neon benders and emerging plasma enthusiasts throughout the United States, as well as internationally. We'll provide in the show notes a listing of prices as of this episode release. But if you want to know more or looking for other tank sizes, please contact Global Rare Gases at 419-661-1465 or by email at jimavolt at globalraregases.com. Before filling, we have some pre-pumping requirements we need to follow. Start by asking, is your piece structurally ready to be pumped? Having followed guidelines from Chapter 2 in designing your vessel, the following structural guidelines will help. Number one, having adequate seals and connections, which includes welding your electrode, extra tubulation, auxiliary parts, and pieces, etc. Number two, checking for scratches, imperfections, and foreign inclusions. This will minimize the damage or risks of breaking or implosion. And with that in mind, number three, remember to wear safety glasses or eye protection. This could be to protect you from scoring a piece or when dealing with an implosion. Safety must come first. You should also ensure that your vessel is clean. A clean vessel has no moisture, and this includes water at the molecular scale, known as water vapor, even though you cannot see water vapor. No organic contaminants, such as dust or organic matter, or residuals from tape, corks, or cleaners, or solvents. And next would be to ask, have you annealed or reannealed your work before starting the pumping process? Well, we can always simplify this to one term, anneal. Why? Because any modifications that you are making to your vessel, like welding on an electrode after coming out of the annealer, will render your piece unannealed. Annealing your work again, whenever possible, for greater chances for structural integrity, cleanliness, and overall success. Now, the annealing process will heat up your glass at a range where water vapor, organic matter, and other contaminants will be baked out. With that in mind, keep it clean. One step you'll want to add to your production of vacuum sealable vessels is to temporarily seal your vessel with a silicone cork or stopper just after they've been annealed. This will preserve the cleanliness of your vessel until evacuation. And the next point, which is one of the most crucial, is to have a vessel that is leak-free. No matter how skilled or well-informed you are in the process of glass making, and that includes skillful scientific and medical application, vacuum leaks continue to be the most common failure in glass. Make no mistake, this is equally witnessed among those who make plasma works as their primary interest. It can be shocking at times when a visually and perceivably well-made glass is unable to hold a vacuum. And we're going to cover the leak checking process after introducing the gas filling manifold. You'll be using a vacuum to locate any potential leaks. And to fill your vessels with gases, we're going to work with gas filling manifold, which consists of a few key components. And we'll have an image up for the plasma manifold on our video version of the podcast on YouTube. So we have the vacuum pump, which is constantly pulling air and gases out of the system and the vessel. You have the vacuum and pressure gauges, which tells us how empty or full the manifold is. And we use this to track our progress in the evacuation and the pumping stage. We're using different units to track vacuum and pressure and detect leaks. We have the gas transfer system, which consists of needle valves, which lets us, lets us control the tiny amounts of gas at a time. We have the gas lines, which connect the tanks and canisters to our system, but also functions as a reservoir. And then we have our tanks, which hold a certain quantity of a specific gas or mixture. 
Then we have our tubulation connection. It's a small reduced tubing that acts as a bridge from your vessel to the manifold. And now that we've defined the parts of the gas filling manifold, let's talk about what the stages of the plasma filling look like. Certainly. Uh, so the process consists of connecting your piece to the manifold, evacuating the piece and manifold, leak checking, closing off the vacuum, filling the manifold, your plasma vessel with gases, and visually checking the plasma vessel, making little adjustments, and then tipping off the manifold system when satisfied. Now let's cover these processes step by step. Start by connecting or welding the tubulation connection to your manifold. One way is connecting via Viton tubing. Using vacuum grease and a special Viton or vacuum grade rubber connects you to a flexible attachment for your unit to your glass. Uh, make sure that the glass tubulation is fire polished on both ends and assembled very closely end to end. And another way is welding your vessel directly to the manifold using the tubulated glass. We're typically working with five to seven millimeter diameter glass, whether that be in borosilicate or soft glass. But do note that welding the tubulation happens at a smaller scale. Refer back to electrode welding in chapter two for a general review of the welding process. And make sure that the vessel is attached to the system when no pushing, tugging, or any movement of the components. And also make sure that the piece is not on a conductive surface. Now, once the vessel is securely attached to the manifold, we can begin leak checking. Firstly, make sure you have an implosion barrier. If you're making a piece with a significant or potentially structural weakness, uh, you definitely want to have this in place. As the first vacuum applied to the vessel is the moment that implosion can happen. Now, to create the physical barrier, use something like a plastic shield or heavy towel if you have any structural concerns. Then pull the vacuum, uh, pull the vessel under vacuum, which would go below one tor. Uh, check with a spark or Tesla coil. All right, so next you'll be taking the tip, you'll put the spark coil on the lowest possible setting, and point the tip towards the electro wire, keeping the spark as small as possible and at a short distance from the glass. You'll be checking all connected areas and manipulated areas of your glass. Any area that has any connections have potential for leaks, and areas that have been stretched from poking holes through can create areas where you may also search for possible thin or weak spots. Good point to make here is that you don't want to point your tip of your spark coil towards any part of the sur surface that you're searching. This will create a concentrated spot which could introduce leaks instead of finding them. And with that, if the spark locates on a single point, then you may have a small leak. Exactly. And if it's soft glass, it's most likely time to start over. But it can be reworked, and that's depending on where the leak is at. If it's a tubulation slash electrode weld, you can try to gently reheat the repair and re anneal the piece. Uh, but if you have a direct weld on your electrode to your piece, it's better off starting over. Now, if you want to attempt a recovery, slowly bring the piece up to working temperature in the kiln. Pick it up from the hot kiln and reattach your electrode to tubulation with a direct weld. Note that it does take a lot of time and it takes a lot of coordination with your studio or facility to make this happen smoothly. And you must be familiar along with your assistant in order to make this very successful. Now, if you have a leak in your borosilicate vessel, mark where the leak is at. Remove it from the system and make your small repairs. This may be just reheating that section and thickening it up or adding glass to that section. You may have to pull out a little bit of that contaminated glass. Maybe it's some type of par particulate that's stuck there. Who knows? And then you would go about re your piece. And you'll notice some visual color cues while you're leak checking. You might notice a purple, fuchsia, or pink color at the spot of the leak, filling the shape of the vessel. A secure or leak-free vessel might have a light blue or have no color at all when checking with a Tesla or spark coil. There may be so few molecules in the vessel that it barely lights up. 
And these suggestions are not hard and fast. This will be relevant to your system's vacuum, which could be within the range of 3 to 10 microns at the lowest point. And we'll include a link in the show notes from Percy's site with suggestions for leak detection equipment and procedures. Now we are on to filling. So once you have checked for cleanliness, structural safety, and leaks, you almost have a primed canvas ready for filling. But there are two last cleaning or finishing steps before adding gases. The first step is using your induction heater on your electrode. The induction heater heats up the conductive metal shell on many neon style electrodes to activate the getter which helps clean up the vacuum. Now while having the vacuum open this allows you to pull that out, right? So this is this will create a gentle orange glow on the electrode shell while you're heating it up. Now before you even go to the next step, you have to let that area cool down. There's some risks that come into play that has been discussed uh, among a few other uh, plasma makers, and that involves you know, the possibility of thermal shocking your glass from having that heated metal shell inducing a lower, colder temperature gla- gas into that area and causing thermal shock. So make sure it's something that it cools down just enough that you can touch it and it doesn't seem like it would, you know, be too hot. Then the next step is flushing or rinsing the vessel. In this step, you're going to pick the cheapest and most dispensable gas, like neon, and fill the vessel up to 20 tor. You will then open the vacuum again to flush out. See, this fresh, clean, pure gas will interact with any residual molecules or particulate that may be inside the vessel from when the bake-out process happened or when you have activated your electrode getters. And that will allow it to come right out, essentially rinsing your vessel out. You are now ready to fill. The canvas has been primed to begin adding your paints of gases. So now you're going to open the vacuum. is still open. And then the plasma transformer is at the ready. If you can, have the options to match the fill of your trans- fill to your transformer. So during filling, you're going to have your transformer wire attached to the neon electrode but switched off. And think about the aesthetic considerations for vessel form, gas expression, and what goals you have in mind. For example, let's say I made a simple sphere that was about six inches across with a tubulated neon electrode at the end. I am going to start looking for a red fill with a gentle arc and a subtle glow. You have to think about what you want in this process. Do you want a glow? Do you want a dynamic effect? And these will kind of guide you and what you'll be doing next. We can now begin the initial gas fill. Prime the gas fill line. Is there pressure in your tank? And is the needle valve and any of the other areas of your manifold closed off? Make sure also the reservoir, the gas fill line, has pressure within it and that your needle valve is nice and closed. Slowly let the neon of 5 to 10 tor into the manifold slash vessel and close needle valve. Adjust as necessary. Turn on the transformer to see results and then turn it off and add 5 to 10 tor at a time until you reach your desired outcome. Evacuate gases by opening the vacuum to lower pressure and change the effects. Note that if you have added two gases and open up the vacuum, both will come out. And be careful that if you're using other gases or vapors like halogens, that opening the vacuum pump will pump those instances or substances into your workspace. So some transformers can be adjusted in power output to influence behavior. Mixing gas effects and transformer effects will happen simultaneously. You also want to avoid flashback whenever possible. You don't want to have a highly conductive fill in your manifold from your plasma transformer. If this happens, Turn off the transformer immediately, take note of what you saw, and add more gas as necessary, or turn down the strength of your transformer. You see, the risks of this happening can damage O-rings in your glass manifold, this can damage the gauges that are hooked up to it, or it can damage the metal components that work to seal and hold back the gases in your tanks. So it's very important that you don't let this cold plasma affect or damage any of the other components that 
it should not be interacting with. And while we're on the topic of filling, let's revisit a quiz question from chapter two. How do you think fill pressure can reduce the danger of implosion from impact or drop? Now, this might be a little spoiler for you guys who haven't yet to take the quiz, but we are here to answer that question. So the power behind the implosion is influenced by several factors. The first is size of the vessel, as well as the fill pressure or vacuum in the vessel. If the vessel has a significant volume, fill it at or greater than quarter atmosphere, which is approximately 190 torr. This will also be the same area where you get your special uh, nice behaviors and effects and arcs, so many people will find themselves past this range already. Now this works because you have less pressure to displace. You know, air will flow from a high pressure to a lower pressure area. So the bigger the vessel, the more area is displaced, therefore the more power the displacement becomes. If you change the differential between atmosphere, which is 760 torr, and you close that gap a little bit more, the less uh, force is produced by that. So once I'm happy with the gas fill and the effects I have, what are the final checks I should be making before I tip off the vessel from the manifold? Well, number one is you want to be satisfied with your fill visually. You know, make sure that you have adequate power to your transformer. You know, you want to make sure that their shocks aren't coming from the vessel, from touching the vessel, or too, which is an indicator of too much power. You don't want it to be too dim, which means you don't have enough power. And you want to match your transformer, uh, match your fill to your transformer threshold. You know, is the transformer hot or overheating, or is it also, you know, screaming or screeching or making little noises that seem to be unsettling? Any of those concerns means you have to make some type of adjustment. Mm -hmm. And once we satisfy those requirements, let's tip off or remove the plasma vessel from the gas manifold or transfer system. So you'll want to have your hand torch ready and adjusted. And I mentioned the use of neon hand torches in chapter two for this use when working with any sort of tubulation. But in particular, now would be a really good time to work with the tipping torch, which I mentioned for soft glass. So you'll want to locate your ideal spot for tipping off the piece from the system. And remember that it's helpful to do the tip off twice leaving yourself some room to make repairs or corrections once you initially remove your work from the manifold. And then also remember to try to keep your distance between the manifold and the electrode. So to execute the tip-off, we're going to evenly heat in a concentrated spot on the tubulation, let the glass wall of the tubulation slowly collapse, and then pull away the vessel to create a gentle point on your piece at the end of the tubulation. To execute the borosilicate tip-off, try to have your constrictions pre-planned. It'll make it a little bit easier on borosilicate because they do not flow as much as soft glass does. So in the same way that we are here to tip off twice, perhaps prepare two areas with constrictions so you may have the same option. And most importantly, you want to do this move once and move on. Tip-offs are incredibly sensitive to reheating and reworking. Now, after the first tip-off, assess the healthier filled plasma vessel. Lie out the piece using your transformer. Confirm your filled vessel is healthy. Has there been any shift in color effects, or is your piece becoming too hot to touch? Are you experiencing any issues? Uh, if you're experiencing any issues, revisit some of the pre-filling checks we discovered uh, earlier. Make sure your tip-off was executed well. This could be another challenge for beginners. Uh, this can also lead to possible leaks at your tip-off. So if you tipped off this first time, well, you have an option to refill if you find yourself with a little bit of a leak. So that's a backup plan, a nice recovery step we had there for you guys. Mm -hmm. Now, leave some time after this initial tip-off to assess the health of the piece and finalize your mounting options. And after assessing the condition of your vessel, you can remove that extra tip-off. So you'll want to locate a safe spot to remove the final tip off, keeping some distance away from the vessel when possible to avoid introducing heat near your finished work. So you'll gently secure the vessel, have your hand torch ready and adjusted, and then execute that final tip off by evenly heating in a concentrated spot of the tubulation 
letting the tubulation collapse and then pulling it away to create a small gentle point. And to reiterate what Percy said before, we're doing this tip off once and not going back to reheat. So now we've covered the alchemy and the process of what it takes to fill your plasma vessel using a manifold. After a short break, we'll discuss how to collaborate with plasma makers and artists and technicians to fill your vessels. Hi, I'm Emily, the Assistant Director of Glass Education Exchange, aka Geeks. Are you learning or teaching glass in the middle of a pandemic? That's right, I'm talking about COVID-19. Geeks is here to support the present and ongoing needs of educators and co-learners through virtual programming and resources, including our Geeks Talks lecture series, our calendar of public glass-related events, community spotlights, and other programming like our monthly book club and weekly movement class. All of our programs are free, donation-based, or low-cost to increase accessibility. You can check us out on the web at geeks.glass and on all social platforms as Geeks Glass. That's one word. If you can't tell already, what we've discussed so far can be technical, complex, and a little overwhelming. Percy and I have learned many of these things through collaborating with others, co-learning as we work with artists, makers, and technicians to try and find a solution together. So we've laid out a few points for beginners in the process to collaborate with others to get started and to make the experiment of plasma go a bit more smoothly. Firstly, do your homework before approaching a collaborator. Try to have a clear goal in mind of what you want to make or explore then following up with existing resources on the web. Look into a wealth of resources I provided on the podcast and blog for Taming Lightning. Look into Plasma and Neon communities online. Some on Facebook include the, the Plasma Art Alliance, the Plasma Appreciation Society, and the Neon and Plasma for Beginners group. You also have the Plasma Art Alliance, which has over 100 members at the moment and Robert House Novial Journal, which we'll have links provided in the show notes, who is a, considered a neon archaeologist uh, who has a plethora of old books and PDFs available online, as well as many writings about what he's been uh, resourcing. And then engaging with those communities and resources to discover potential collaborators, opportunities, and more. And then, of course, taking a workshop is always a great way to get started and meet other beginners, but it's up to you to keep learning. Once you have a sense of what you want to explore or try, we have a few questions you can ask possible collaborators. Some of those questions would be, are you providing services? Who or what are they providing services for? And how much? And then get their expectations in line for what they want or would need to help you out. Now, we have a few examples of collaborators as we have recorded this in 2021. We have Bruce Suba, Zach Willis from Glass, Urban Glass with Emily Craddock and so many other technicians there. And each of them have a different set of expectations and varying services that they provide. You know, I provide these examples for collaborators because the number of people working in this field are very small. And there are some people who are currently providing services at this point, but this may change or you may find unexpected collaborators. And this reminds me of your story with one of your first collaborations, making pieces with super signs, which you talked about in chapter one. Right. So I, I took a workshop at Pilchuck in 2014 with Patrick Collentine. And one of the first things I did uh, was I was encouraged to do was to meet up with a neon person or neon shop. Now, I didn't understand the workings of neon, nor did I understand anything about plasma. But there's a small distinction on what my approach was like. So when I contacted Super Science, I said, sure, bring it by. We'll see what we can do. I made sure to bring my transformer, an induction heater, and multiple pieces of Super Science. What did that allow me to do? Well, I had something that I could power it. I had the induction heater because they won't need an induction heater for neon. They're using a bombarder to heat up the tube and electrodes. Mm -hmm. And I provide multiple pieces for the very likelihood of a leak and failure. So it was up mm -hmm. to me to know about the process enough when working with this person because they've never done plasma. 
There's a little bit in the Neon Techniques book about plasma, but it doesn't tell you anything about how to work that process. So through mm -hmm. that, having that helpful, having the information, having the healthy conversation and respect, I was able to build a relationship with that company and was able to have enough pieces for my show, at least be able to start that process with them. And they were willing to explore and be open throughout that process as well. I wanted to jump back in and really kind of expand on my last statement. So Super Signs allowed me to really start that process of working with Plasma. Gave me the, the sense that this was definitely a possibility that I could work with. Even though I was basically fresh in the sea of the potential for Plasma with very little working knowledge. As mentioned, it's very important that I had a sense of how the process worked, the tools and the equipment that I had, and then the batching or multiple works because I was going to have failures as a newbie, like a really fresh newbie. That stage in which I worked with Super Science led me into the second part of that collaboration, which is when our schedules did not line up, and whether that be school or them having more work to do, whether it's installation or neon work, whatever it is, right? Um, so I reached out to someone I remember that took the class, and that was Ash Williamson. You can listen to him on episode number two of the podcast. He was a really big help in just being available and being nearby uh, to help out. So I went over to his place, stayed the night. We pumped neon and plasma all night, and uh, you know we got it done, and that was how my exhibition, my 2015 thesis exhibition for my BFA program, was able to happen. It was because of his big help. Um, so I don't have a lot of images that work. It is kind of for the archives, for the memory. Um, but I, I do plan on going back to that work. But I just wanted to jump in and say that to kind of re-clarify that Super Science wasn't a big portion. It was a start. And Ash Williamson helped me collaborate to finish the process of having pieces pumped and filled, which is really awesome. So connecting with people, your contemporaries, and knowing those connections is important here. And having those relationships are very important. And if I happen to start a successful collaboration, what should I keep in mind? Well, Ben, do your homework. What we really mean by this is being willing to learn and continue to learn and never stop at the first level of understanding. Because the more you learn, the more you realize what you don't know. And to manage your expectations. When we talk about fabrication versus collaboration, Plasma tends to be more collaborative because you're relying on someone else's skill sets, as well as the many ranges of effects that are exploratory or experimental. The effects depend on what you provide and what you are looking for. Your vessel shape, size, and form via cavities or constrictions, etc., as mentioned in Chapter 2, will affect that. You may have an idea, but you need to be aware of its limits and perhaps find an acceptable compromise. You are an artist, and creativity requires some flexibility. But as an alchemist, regardless of your position in this process, you have the power of transmutation to transform the work based on its attributes. Fabrication is something that's more akin to neon, where technical drawings can be fabricated into light based on consistent glass bending, processing, and transformer technology that was born out of an industry that has been using the same process for almost 100 years. Plasma has so many variables that make the process unique to what each person is making when it comes to that vessel crafting, the filling, the technology, and more. And again, stay open to the possibilities and trust your collaborators are willing to do their best. Some of the things that you must also manage your expectations is not to expect the leaks will be fixed for you. Some fixable leaks are, well, they'll be on the electro connections or on the borosilicate for plasma vessels, areas that are easily accessible and don't involve changing the, the shape or manipulating the details of your form or the risk of doing such. And these will also depend on the comfort and skill level of your collaborator. Otherwise, many of them will help point out your leaks, and then it's up to you to decide on how you want to resolve it. So in order to remedy the issue of going the one, one out and going home, you have to batch your plaza vessels whenever possible. Try not to cut corners. 
When you batch your pieces, you're providing yourself with more opportunities for success. Multiple vessels means more chances for successful fills and also more exploration and ranges. If you have more than one piece, you can look at these different effects that you kind of said, okay, I like this, this, and this. Now you can go and you have something to work with to, to change or decide on, which is great. And then most important, send your transformer your plan to use with the piece. Having multiple transformers will help cover the range of effects and sizes, and your collaborator will be able to tune your piece to the fill of the transformer. And talking about transformers, let's discuss some of the technology behind illuminating our plasma vessels and how that might work. So how does the transformer turn the gases in our vessel into that illuminated plasma? So as we uh, talked about earlier, um, the transformer sends out a high voltage and high radio frequency field of energy through that single wire. That energy field then travels from that power source into your vessel through your electrode. This breaks off the electrons and begins the plasma effect. Now, unlike neon, power does not always travel in a straight path. Yep. And with neon, the transformer is high voltage and it basically runs in a circuit with the power going through the gases as a current of energy. In plasma, the ground to that energy is in the air and your hands and just whatever is around it. Exactly. Now that we have a better sense of how these plasma unit pieces are powered, let's revisit the electrode. So the electrode transfer energy into the plasma piece, and we've mostly discussed neon electrodes uh, but since we're covering technology, now is a good time to talk about making capacitive electrodes. Now, the capacitive electrode uses a conductive material to transfer energy through the glass into the mixture inside. Rather than a direct connection, having a seal going through the glass, this is just a way to become an antenna to amplify and direct the high-frequency radio waves through the glass. Now that we kind of have an understanding of how that actually worked early on in this chapter. So... The capacitive electrode uh, can be done through certain materials. And these are all conductive materials here. Um, you can create it through using copper, tapes, sheet, rod, and tubing. Uh, it can be graphite, you know, using aquadog or carbon paint, or using graphite rod, pad, sheet of any fabrication there. You have what I've recently played around with, which is 3D con uh, conductive 3D filament. Uh, from 3D printers and using that to create custom fit connections or aesthetically pleasing uh, modes of connecting that to the piece. You can use silver conductive epoxy, which is something I use in conjunction with my collaboration with Chris Ahalt to connect one piece to the back of the moose head. Uh, the use of fireball uh, lusters for glass. These are like gold or metal lusters, uh, something that Wayne Stratman has suggested uh, that I could have done with the moose head, but now I have that understanding. Now we expanded our vocabulary here for it. So there's a lot of variables involved in this process. There are a lot of things that you can approach. Uh, some of the good options is you have an aesthetic and functional opportunities. You, like, for example, adding the effects to the chains on my onus piece, uh, as we discussed in chapter two, where I can either use that as a con uh, conductive, a capacitive coupling electrode in order to have the energy travel from the chains. And you may find more ways to work with the arc expressions and internal illuminations through that as well. Uh, some of the, the bad options or the, the, the risks that you, that you take here is that you must be able to control that, your, your fill and the power that goes through that. Remember how we talked about leak checking? You don't want to point something directly at the glass and have a you know single focus point of energy. Well, if you have uh, your your power too much power on that external source and there's a gap, then that gapping will arc through the air and touch that single point. That could heat up your glass and crack it if it is soft glass. It could poke a hole through it if it's glass in any of the glasses in general. So you have to be you have to take a lot of care and and how you design the external electrode, where it's placed, its distance, and how you illuminate it. And it can be a little difficult to control some of those variables, but we do have some safety considerations in mind. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not leaving the capacitive electrode exposed. For example, you want to be able to prevent contact or touching with any conductive surfaces or anyone who may be interacting with it. 
There's an example I did on Instagram where I talked about the onus piece. Well, shoot, if I'm powering the um, the chain, I can't protect someone from touching that. So that that puts a limit right there. But if I'm powering you through the electrode on the same piece, well, the chain will be conductively, uh, uh, capacitively coupled and it'll be conducted through that. Well, I can ground the chain so if someone touches the chain, if it's illuminated through the electrode, then they won't get shocked. And I could provide, we'll provide video of that as well. And this is a good segue to discuss safely connecting the transformer slash power supply to the neon style electrode or capacitive electrode that we're using in our pieces. Certainly. Um, so if you're connecting your high voltage wire securely, you want to make sure that you know the wire isn't loose and is not exposed or poking anywhere. So you know you could do things like using uh, ways to conceal that by using like silicone or plastics, wire caps, um, even shrink wrap or uh, electrical uh, you know coverings and things of that sort. Though anything that's going to keep those mm -hmm. secured and, and away from being touched, but also insulate them. And once you've securely connected and insulated these connections from your transformer to your vessel, go ahead and turn it on. And also adjust your adjustable transformer if needed after filling. So now we've gone through the steps of filling and illuminating our pieces. Is there anything we should think about while we're finishing up our pieces? Yeah, there's some considerations you, sh you should think about when determining where and how you present your finished work. You know, with placement, uh, you want to use uh, a mount made of a non-conductive material, preferably um, an insulative material. And if you're using metal, properly ground and shield from your transformer. So many plasma transformers come with an added grounding wire that you can use which is also part of some other configurations used when uh, grounding your capacitive coupled piece, depending on where it is. Now, when it comes to electrical components like your transformer and wires, you have some aesthetic uh, choices that you, that you must put into place. Because that is an essential part of your plasma lamp and also an essential part of a neon piece, you have to decide on whether you want to hide the cord or, and the transformer you want to just ignore it and say it's part of it. That's how it is. You know, it exists. Um, or you embellish or integrate it in some way. Um, and then also you want to make sure that your piece is within proximity to a power outlet, which will be very helpful, especially in gallery settings. You also want to make sure your piece and transformer can be installed for service. So this could be in case of repairs, alterations, or adjustments. So leaving it a way that it can be... Um, disassembled if needed uh, by your hand or with uh, a dedicated instruction to a trusted associate. Um, having details on how to assemble and disassemble is also just a big part of having a installable piece or shipping for installing as an artist. Mm -hmm. You also want to make sure you have the final product placed in mind. Uh, placement in mind. So are you designing the piece for touch, interaction, or public display? And this is a question that a lot of us are going to be asking ourselves, and it's a question that I don't think we've thought a lot about. We kind of look at glass as an um, artistic medium, and as it goes in the gallery, it means no touch. Um, so you want to consider having a stable amount of your work, uh, being careful attention having careful attention to the plasma transformer technology of hands are interacting with the work and also think about the location of work. If it's going in the exhibit gallery or public space, people may want to touch the work, even if it's not allowed. So having that safety net of knowing how to secure it so that the galleries don't have to have a panic attack, you don't have to have a panic attack, you know, it just helps out. It never hurts to err on the safe side. <laughs> and also remember that plasma is not as bright as neon, so you should have a sense of where the pieces can exist. Yeah, consider darker spaces for install, something a bit more intimate, right? You know, avoid placing it next to really bright light sources. Some pieces can hang in sort of a decently lit or low lit area, but, you know, one of the things that we got from Harry, like a pro tip from her, is implementing shadow boxes when displaying work in a brighter environment. Mm -hmm. And now that we've covered filling, electrifying, and mounting our plasma vessels, 
Let's conclude the episode and share a few takeaway exercises and activities. Today's podcast is sponsored by Information Unlimited, founded in 1974 by Bob Iannini, whose work helped pave the way to make high voltage accessible to everyone. Information Unlimited is a pioneer in DIY electronics for hobbyists and hackers, experimenters, and researchers, holding many patents that have contributed to the electronics and specifically the high voltage fields, which includes the plasma drivers, power supplies, and miscellaneous tools used by myself and many learning and practicing plasma light artists and enthusiasts. Now, when I began my plasma journey, I was introduced to the entry-level plasma driver Neon 21, and later the PVM-12 and PVM-400 models. If you get an opportunity to take the plasma workshops or classes that are available, you will find these listed among the few commercially available plasma drivers. Now to purchase these plasma drivers or transformers, go to AmazingOne.com. That's Amazing, the number one, dot com. Hover over the tab Neon and Plasma and select Transformers Single End and Special Effects. Now there's a lot to see in this website and we'll be sure to provide you with links in our show notes. If you have any questions about their products, you can give them a call at 603-673-4730. So Percy, we've covered a lot of ground today in the areas of alchemy and technology. Definitely. Uh, To summarize chapter three, we discussed what plasma is, the difference gases we use in plasma, the aesthetic considerations for gases, fill pressure, and color, how to prepare your plasma vessel for pumping, using a gas filling manifold, collaborating with other plasma makers and artists, plasma powering technology, and considerations for installation. As you can tell, we've gone a lot, we've gone through a lot today, and the definitions and approaches we provided are not exhaustive. These are just some general guidelines and an overview of the process to orient you in starting your own plasma journey. So let's discuss some exercises, activities, and takeaways for listeners to get started. One thing is to think about making a DIY leak checker. You can create some simple leak checkers by purchasing a vacuum pump, some tubing, and a spark coil to create a modified plasma manifold. Uh, A simple investment takes a bit of time, but will greatly assist you and give you crucial feedback in your vessel crafting process. So I have a Taming Lightning article in the works. Keep an eye out for that in, in the future year. Uh, but also stay tuned for Chapter 4, Starting Your Plasma Journey, where we'll cover a building your own plasma setup. Some other takeaways includes batching your units. Never be afraid of making multiples. Take this as an opportunity to increase your chances of success and put practice into your craft. The next point is to sketch, draw, and plan. Having an idea in mind of where you want to go will help you shape your approach to filling your vessels, illumination, collaborating, and more. And secondly, take the chapter two quiz to review concepts and terms that we implemented in the vessel filling process today, which you can find on our podcast pages at Taming Lightning and Geeks.Glass to get started. Also consider joining the Plasma community and start a collaboration. We'll provide, we'll provide links to some of the communities we mentioned today in our show notes. And lastly, practice empathy. Chemistry of collaboration works on relationships. You can only be successful when you give 100%. You're human. They're human. The only way to get this together is to work together. And we're closing out our intro to Plasma series with Chapter 4, Starting Your Plasma Journey. We'll cover Percy's journey as a self-starter in Plasma and maybe pick up some lessons along the way listening to his story. As well as considerations for building your own plasma studio. We'll get into technology, resources versus resourcefulness, and more. Thanks, Percy. I'm looking forward to talking with you in Chapter 4. I'm really grateful for the knowledge you've organized and shared with geeks so far. 
And I'd say this is a pretty cool collaboration. A hundred percent, man. It takes a lot to do this series, and I appreciate what I learned from you as well. Great. Well, I'll talk to you then. All right. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning podcast. Music credits to the following artists in order of appearance. Retro by One, Serenity, produced by Ready Man, Boost by Joaquin Karud, Mixtape, produced by Ready Man, Sunnyside by One, Reentry by Lapse, and The Process by Lakey Inspired. Please check out the show notes for links to the artists. This has been another challenging episode, and like the previous chapter, had a lot to cover, consider, and expand on. This is really just an overview of the process, where each subject and consideration could have its own discussion. It may seem odd that we don't talk much about specific suppliers. This is mainly due to how often these businesses change or shift, whether in operation or in inventory. I'll do my best to answer those questions in additional blogs or updating related posts. So expect show notes and links on the Geeks and Taming Lightning website to feature updates over time. In any case, we welcome questions posted on YouTube, blogs, and the podcast. Now, I've worked a lot of different jobs, and often people ask me what I'm doing today. Well, as we heard in some of our mid-roll here, I work in hospitality. And as much as I don't like working in hospitality, especially now during the pandemic, and would rather explore the medium of plasma in a financial capacity. Now, those experiences in customer service provided some important lessons, not just in interacting with people, but in recognizing the importance of and striving for greater empathy and understanding in the responsibility that you have for your behavior, which is a big part of the chemistry required for collaboration. Now, working with sponsors is a big deal for me. I say the connections I made in the last four years, in addition to Geeks, has been very helpful in this process. Global Rare Gases has truly been a big part of my supply for gases, and it's true, I do recommend that to everyone. And Jim is just a great guy to talk to. And Information Unlimited has been fundamental to this medium for both beginner and professional artists learning and working in plasma. Now, I'd like to thank Geeks for inviting me to collaborate for this series, director Helen Lee for starting the conversation, the assistant director, Emily Leach, whose work with Ben, with social media, and on the video, and the graph designer and web manager, Ben Orozco, whose co-hosting and content management skills have been outstanding and much appreciated. Lastly, I'd like to thank the Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration, as well as encouraging me to pursue this project, and the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing and supportive people. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, please donate to the Taming Lightning Geeks Intro to Plasma series. You can find all current episodes and information at geeks.glass. That's G double e x dot glass now should money be tight please consider checking out the intro to plasma series on youtube and leave a comment about what you find useful and questions about what you'd like to hear from current and future chapters i'll have links provided in the show notes so please share comment and subscribe and as always be safe be healthy and be strong and i'll see you next time